On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. I was uh, pondering this miracle, kind of, and thinking, like, just what does it mean, Lord? Like, I, I kind of don't get it. I, I know it so well. Um, some of you may know it so well, and it's very iconic, and even non-believers probably know about this miracle, you know, just through popular culture and and popular Bible stories. Let's review real quick from the last few weeks. So the, the last few weeks, we've been studying the themes of prophecies of Jesus, Jesus being the Son of God or the Lamb of God and His identity, and following Him when we hear His call. Okay, so we've been talking about all those things, which are big, heavy issues. I mean, they're what the faith is based on. But let's jump to um, go through some of the highlights of what I just read. So let's go to John 2, verse 4. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus had a plan for his ministry, and it wasn't quite time for him to start revealing himself um, to his people fully. Okay, so we see in this verse even the pushback. Almost, like, I don't want to say pushback, but yeah, I guess, yeah, a little bit of a pushback. Like, the Lord's like, I'm not, like, ready to start doing this. Like, you know, I have a plan. So remember, Jesus must be in his, like, late 20s or 30s at this point, and he is not yet known as the man who can perform miracles, right? He's not the way we know him now. Historically, um, he's still yet to be the guy who cures the blind, heals the sick, starts doing all these things, and also preaching the word of God in a very new and refreshing radical way that the Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't used to. If Jesus had a plan, how much more should we have plans for our own lives and not just rush into things, whether that be relationships, finances, careers, you name it, anything, whatever it is in life. I see this theme, I've seen this theme in my own life, and sometimes I see this theme in other people's lives where people do just rush into things without thinking. Jesus chose to reveal himself when he wanted and over what he wanted. The servants and disciples know that they know of this miracle, right? But the master of the feast does not know. Um, and so in all this, the way he does it, just the way he goes about doing it and how he responds to his mother, to me, and I think we can see this, Jesus had a strategy for his life and ministry. And as you go forward and read the rest of John and all the gospels, Jesus several times says stuff to the effect of like, like, you know, don't, tell any but like he cures one guy right the blind guy think and tells him go but don't like go make a big deal and tell everybody about it um because i i i know that jesus knew what was coming right and so he's like well i can't reveal myself just right now whether you guys want me to or not like i have a plan and a strategy of how i'm going to accomplish this right and he wanted I mean, I, I can't say what he wanted. He's he's God. I don't know how the mind of God works like that. Um, but we can see this as evidence of that strategy and planning and a methodicalness to it. One lesson to learn from all this, I believe, is yes, we do have to plan and strategize our lives to the best of our abilities and in accordance with the scripture and God. And that's good. That's a good thing. But once we've done that, we can let go and then that's where our faith kicks in and we can let go. 
you can only plan so much guys and and we know that even when you plan to the best of your abilities there's still a good chance that there's still a good chance that your plans won't even come to fruition anyway i'm sure we can all relate to that like oh i planned on doing this and i planned on doing this and i planned on doing this and i took the steps to do it and that thing still didn't happen quite the way i wanted or it didn't happen at all or it did happen but it actually hand ended up happening in a different way so i think we can again if jesus planned and strategized so can we but then we rest in 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 our faith in jesus and god and that's why it's so important to follow him and do the small things like you know don't lie don't cheat don't steal uh don't commit adultery like those 10 commandments like all those together are like guiding our life like the day in and day out of our lives let's go back to verse 2 4 and jesus said to her woman what does this have to do with me my hour has not yet come i want to say i sense a bit of irritation on jesus's part in that one little verse and the way it's worded and the way he questions her woman what does this have to do with me you know i kind of get like he's annoyed and i couldn't help but think like Jesus, and I don't know for sure, so I might be theorizing here a little bit, but we're going based off of the text, right? And what we can glean from studying it. In the big scope of things, God, Jesus came to die for man's sins. Him turning water into wine, to me, seems trivial compared to his ultimate mission, right? Like, I'm here to, like, die, be killed and tortured, and then raised from the dead. You know, and my mom is, is asking about not having wine at these guys' weddings. Jesus is like, sounds like the bridegroom's problem. Like, no, no offense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or Jesus is like, I don't even drink, so I'm cool. All good. I'll take water. Um, the, the way this verse is written also implies that there's pressure coming from his mother Mary to do something about it, right? Because the way it's worded again, she just makes a statement in the scripture, they have no wine. And then Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? So to me, if we're reading in between the lines, and gleaning like meaning out of it studying it like i said it implies that she is putting some kind of pressure on him and i don't know like my mind goes to like a nagging mom almost you know what i mean you know how moms are and you're like, like i could see a mo mom in modern day times being like oh we don't have wine we don't have wine you know and everyone being like chill mom it's all good you know and i'm not saying that's for sure but that's what i kind of get out of it he still performs the miracle and turns the water into wine so I wrote, Jesus loves us and knows all of our wants, hopes, and desires, no matter how small or significant they may be to other people. He's a good, loving father, and he knows everything about us. He knows little things. He knows our big dreams, our big hopes, our big wants. He knows our little, again, insignificant ones that wouldn't matter to anyone else. The Lord gave me this story that I was able to draw back on from like hearing it in the car like a week ago on the Christian radio station. And I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but I think it reinforces this theme of like him being a loving, good father who maybe even to him, it's insignificant. Him being, you know, God, the, the creator of the universe. You know what I mean? If you're like, God, I really would like a pack of bubble gum. You know what I mean? God's like on the grand scheme of things. It's like you could go a day without a pack of bubble gum, but him being the loving father that he is, he's like, here's your pack of bubble gum. And I see that in my life. And I even see that in, in like uh, my friends and family's lives who are believers. He was saying, and he was an older guy telling like part of his life testimony and his relationship with God. And he said when he was like younger, you know, and his daughter was just like a toddler him and his wife were, you know, still young and, and a, a budding, starting family. And, and, and they wanted to pursue the Lord. They were Christians and they were following the Lord. But he was talking about like how something to the effect came up of, of finances. And he was praying and seeking God about like, what do I do with like my money and my finances, Lord? And he said one day he, he, he heard God respond and, and speak to him and he's like in my heart i heard the lord r respond and say um um uh i want you to give it all to me all right and so he was like all right lord he was excited because he felt like he had heard god speak to his heart and soul and he's like okay lord i'm gonna give you everything and in in this cute little story i can't remember the details but he had a sum of money in this instance that 
he was not knowing what to do with, I guess. And so when he heard the Lord say, I want you to give it all, he literally was like, all right, Lord, I'll give it all. I think it was like 60 bucks. And I don't remember what it was for, but this was the, the beginning of the Lord showing him how to use his finances. And, um, he said, I, I was, I was eager to give it all. And I prayed one last prayer though. And I was like, Lord, but can I keep like a dollar or two? Because he would always come home and bring his daughter like a little treat, like a little candy or a little toy. And he always, you know, he said, I always saved like a few bucks to get her her treat. So when I came home, I could give my daughter who was like a toddler, her little treat, you know? And he said, I prayed and was like, Lord, but can I keep like a dollar or two? And again, he's like, I felt like I heard the Lord again. And the Lord said, no, like, you know, I'm teaching you about finances, son. You asked and the answer is I want it all. And so he was like, he said, admittedly, I was disappointed, but I had just made this deal in my heart with the Lord, you know, and I was grateful that he told me and gave me an answer. So I was obedient and I gave all the money. But then just the way the Lord is and the reason I'm bringing this up is something happened to the effect that somebody ended up giving him two or three dollars or giving him offhandedly gave him a treat so that when he went home, he was still able to give his little toddler daughter that treat that he would always get her you know what i mean and he was like in that moment i knew that all my prayers are heard by the lord no matter like how little or insignificant they seem for me to bring that treat to my little you know baby girl firstborn daughter meant the world to me on the grand scheme of things could she have gone without a candy bar you know or a little trinket or a little toy she could but the Lord knew how much that meant to me. And because I was obedient, I was still able to give her her treat in the, this instance, you know, and that story stuck with me. And when I was doing this Bible study, I thought how it kind of connects to what we're studying in this theme. All right, let's jump to John 2, 5. So the next verse, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And so just right off the bat, this is a simple one to understand. There's no metaphor here. This is Mary's advice to the servants. When it comes to Jesus and God in that story I just told about the man and the money, do what God tells you. We have the big obvious things in the Ten Commandments. No lying, no stealing, no cheating, no adultery, no other gods before him. Like those are all easy to understand. And we can we can do that and we can work on those things, okay? But then when it comes down to the details of our lives, like again, the little insignificant things, things that I might be struggling with that the next guy, it's not a struggle for him at all. You know what I mean? Something that I desire or want or I'm trying to work through is not the next guy's struggle or desire or want. And so when it comes to the Lord, you know, and this requires seeking him, praying, working on any sins that you are struggling with things in your life that you know you shouldn't be doing and there, there's a lot of them again the 10 commandments kind of sums up like the spirit of the law but then there's the specifics of like how that works you know lying can be a lot of forms stealing could come in a lot of different forms though the struggle for sin is generally all the same for us the little details of each one of our sins can be different from others you know and so this is why it's important to just literally do what the Lord says or what he's calling you to do. Trust me. I know. Okay. But let's see. Um, Mary tells the servants to do whatever it is Jesus asks of them. We have all heard the phrase, nobody knows you better than your own mother or something to that effect, right? If you're raised by a mother and have a mother in your life, mothers, fathers too, but mothers in particular, they know their children very well. You know, they know what makes their children tick. They know what makes their kids happy. Um, they know what like kind of moods their kids are in and all that stuff, you know, and, and parents and mothers, they can read their kids very well. So this is no different with Mary and her son, Jesus. Obviously, she knows he's special if she was a virgin when she conceived him. First of all, obviously, that's obvious. There's something already clearly unique, special and different about Jesus. But we don't know for sure, but she has seen him growing up the last 30 years and imagine what she learned of him throughout that time. The reason say, I say we don't know for sure, and this is a criticism, 
criticism of the Bible that we lose track of Jesus from approximately the age of like 12 or 13 up until about now, like what we study at the beginning of, of John. There's like, I've heard it like referred to as the missing years or the secret years, you know, so I guess technically none of us know what Jesus was do doing during this time. After I studied this today, again, just one of my theories, but I think he was just being a normal average guy. He was a carpenter. We know that, you know, so I just, and he was from a poor unknown part of um, Israel, right? So I, I think he was just an everyday, ordinary, poor man. You know, that's what I think, um, but I don't know for sure. But going with that theory, if Mary was with him as he grew up into his late 20s, early 30s, she would know how her son is, right? She would know what kind of person he was, how smart he was, how talented he was, etc. All that, his personality, whatever, his likes, dislikes, she would have known all those things about him. And Mary has faith to tell the servants to essentially obey him. Okay, so then if we jump to verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And so the, even in this little specific example, John 2, 7 is Jesus' specific instruction to fill the jugs of water. They do, and a miracle is performed. So just simple, really. Do what Jesus says. Jesus might have a specific instruction for you to do in your life that might not pertain to the next guy. Like you might be in a specific situation and you're praying and you're seeking God and you might be confused and not know which way to go. You know, I encourage you to seek the Lord through prayer, through Christian counsel, through the word of God, the Bible. I have faith that God is faithful and he will give you an answer, you know, and it, it's one thing. There's a difference between sin and mistakes also. You know what I mean? Like we all make mistakes and those aren't necessarily sins. But I would say all sins are mistakes. Um, but sometimes you just make an honest mistake and, and you, you, you get through it. And then this is interesting, but also note that the jugs of water are for Jewish purification rites. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Because um, Jesus, as we know and believe, becomes the ultimate purification rite. Okay. And we're going to get in now to like the significance of like the wine and what, what wine means and represents. Um, so I did a little research, but um, this is like the significance of wine in ancient times. But wine developed into an important agricultural product that had economic as well as medical, social and ritual significance. Okay, guys. So that's important. In antiquity, every advanced civilization had a deity who represented wine and the enjoyment of wine. For example, Osiris in Egypt, Dionysus in Greece, and Bacchus. Um, am I butchering that? And Bacchus or Bacchus in Rome. Okay, interesting. Wine was diluted in ancient times, not only to lower the alcohol content to drink more, but to be able to sanitize or purify the water. The natural antibacterial qualities of wine would help purify the unclean water at the time. Due to this, anyone of any age would drink their water with wine as it was a safer way to consume water. Okay. And wines that were not, uh, wines that were not diluted were held for the poorer population as the non-diluted wine was very strong and vinegary. Nobles drank the wines that were sweetened up with honey and water to make it more drinkable. So let's get into more like the the significance of this miracle, more like symbolically or, or what's the message in this miracle. We kind of went over the like literal details of the miracle and like examples we can get from it. But now we're going to talk about to me like the well, to me, this is like the cooler, deeper meaning of this whole thing and what Jesus is expressing um, John 2.11, this is referred to as the first of his signs. So um, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So again, this is significant. If this is like the first miracle he chooses to do, we can infer he's trying to tell us something. And also I, I've read that this is considered his first public miracle. And this is where I don't think it's really controversial, um, but Maybe some people would think it is, but um, I argue that it was his first semi-public miracle. As the scriptures indicate, 
and I talked about this earlier, the master of the feast didn't know how the wine came about, right? Um, but it says the servants knew, and then the disciples knew. All right, so the Lord was selective in who got to actually see the miracle. And when he takes it out, when they take it out to the wine master or the feast master, he has no idea the miracle that just occurred, right? Let's see, his disciples see the his first miracle, and this goes back to the last week's Bible study in which, in which Jesus said, come and you will see. So remember, going back to last week's Bible study, the disciples were seeking Jesus, and Jesus asked them, what are you seeking? And then they asked him, like, where are you staying? And then he said, come and you will see. And last week, I talked a lot about how God has something to show us all as individuals. And we'll, we'll never know that unless we accept him and choose him and seek him. And it's a huge major decision that you have to make. It really is, man. And, and I would ask you if, if you're lost and you don't know where to start, um, if maybe you're feeling a pull to Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, I would highly encourage you to pursue that. Um, I mean, look into it, you know? look into the truth. Uh, I talk about this a lot, but there's three steps for me as how I came to be a believer. Um, I asked myself, A, is there truth? I came to the conclusion, yes, there has to be truth. Um, B, if there's truth, the next question is, well, then is there a God? You know, yes or no. The way we envision a God in control of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent, all that, like knows everything at all times, God. And I came to the conclusion that, yes, that is true. There is a God. And then the third question became, well, then who is God? And, and can I know him? Those, those three things will lead you to the truth. Um, and it was a series for me and it's different for everybody. And that's just something I like to summarize and tell people like if they're struggling or they're curious or they're asking me about it, you know, my first question is like, do you believe that there is a truth? Is there truth in the world? Let's take religion, God, Jesus, and the Bible out of it for a second. And do you believe that there's a truth, right? Cause if you can say, no, I don't believe there's truth. Or like in our popular culture, we're going to this whole like, oh, well, that's his truth and that's their truth and that's her truth. And well, that won't work. You know what I mean? There can't be 30 things that are simultaneously true. So, so when we see that the disciples and the servants get to see the miracle, but other people don't, um, what I, I got from this is like non-believers don't necessarily get the privilege of what believers get to see because of their ignorance or lack of faith or combination of the two. So before you come to the knowledge of Christ, you're just ignorant and your eyes and ears might not be open to seeing God's glory. Okay. Especially in these little insignificant ways, these littler things that again, might not mean much to someone else, but to you, you know, between you and God, like that is God answering a prayer or talking to you or helping you or, or whatever. Um, so either your ignorance won't let you see it yet because you just don't know, um, or you have a lack of faith and that lack of faith, you won't know. It requires faith. The Bible's clear on that. You know, like when it talks about Abraham, Abraham had faith and it was accredited, accredited to him as righteousness. And, and the story of my life has been a long drawn out ba battle and my struggle with faith for myself. I've gone through my ups and downs. I've gone through my periods of, of doubting and having no faith. And I even went to the point of where I like tested God. I, I straight up thought to myself like, well, if you're real, I'm going to test you. And I highly don't recommend that. But unfortunately, I think a lot of us are stubborn, sinful people. And unfortunately, if we have to crash and burn, to come to God, we, we, that's the way we have to come to God. And I'm here to tell you there's an easier way. You know what I mean? Uh, just get on Google and start looking up stuff about the facts of the Bible and Jesus and God. Like start there if you don't know where to start. Um, 
but for me, it was just this long, drawn-out battle. Um, and I don't recommend it. Because in the end, God won. Um, but anyways, let's see. The next point. The wine represents a complete change or a radical change, right? So it goes from being water to wine. Um, and then based on what we read about, like, <clears throat> the significance of wine and the history of, like, ancient wine... It's not just any old water. We take for granted in America, well, it's getting kind of bad as, as the days and years go on with having clean drinking water in every home, city, town, whatever. You know what I mean? Um, but for the most part, for the last 100 years, in general, we can all go to a faucet and get clean running water, you know, but in those ancient times, it wasn't as easy as turning on a faucet, right? So not only is it water, but it's ordinary polluted drinking water um, that's being changed into a beverage that holds much more importance, especially in those times. Okay. Wine, it requires a process. It requires time, energy, and money talking about literal wine. Like the process to make wine is in itself a process, right? You don't just snap your fingers and create wine as a, as men, ordinary humans. We have to grow the grapes, right? We have to harvest the grapes. We have to then let the grapes ferment. Um, I don't know if that's all there was to the process back then. Um, but, you know, it's gotten more and more technical as the years went on. Like it said in that article, they added water and they added honey, you know, and nowadays we have all sorts of wines and they do all sorts of crazy specific processes to it. But what I'm trying to show is this radical change, ordinary polluted drinking water versus something that is like processed and a lot of time, thought, energy, resources has to go into it in order to create it. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's the difference between, you know, before you have God and when you have God. Um, ordinary water represents sinful humans and wine represents the spirit of God. Just like wine was needed to be added to water to make it clean and sanitary. So too, we humans need the spirit of God to be added to our sinful spirits to make us clean and holy. And that's what I learned in doing my studying of all this stuff and preparing for this Bible study. Oftentimes, um, wine does re represent like Jesus or God, right? Remember he even said, when you do Holy Communion, you're drinking of my blood, you know, and it was represented through, through wine and that we do that to this day, right? At my church, we have Holy Communion and we take we take grape juice because we don't actually use literal wine, but we take grape juice that signifies wine. Um, and we, we honor that we live off of, of Jesus's life and death. Um, and the Catholics do it in the Eucharist too, right? So they honor what Jesus said and they drink of the wine <clears throat> and um, eat the wafers that represent Jesus's body. Okay. So what I'm getting at is like Jesus God, the Holy Spirit is representative. Wine is representative of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. But see, once a little wine is added to water or vice versa, they mix and become one, right? You can't differentiate between the two anymore. And when we accept Christ, this is how God sees us. This is how we avoid eternal damnation. God will see his son Jesus in us on judgment day. Again, I learned that like today by doing this study and, and reading and praying and all that God showed me that and then plus knowledge that I've had from previous scriptures studying in my life when we accept Christ into our life the spirit of God comes to live in us the spirit that was in Jesus that that he was able to accomplish that per perfect victorious life well, we invite that spirit to come into our lives and to change us and to work on us so that we can become better men, women, right? Um, so we acknowledge that we're broken, sinful, fallen, and that we do need a savior and we do need help out of, out of this situation of humanity and sin. You know, there's just no avoiding it. And that's who Jesus is and what he does. And so when we invite him... God, the Holy Spirit to live in us, 
just like the water and wine, they mix to where God doesn't differentiate between the two anymore. It's all mixes into one. And on judgment day, he's going to see his son in us. And that's why we won't be judged and, and sent to eternal damnation, you know? And it's not because of anything that we were able to accomplish on our own. Um, and we could do a whole other Bible study, and I brought it up before. But when you believe that, when you believe in Jesus, your life from that moment on changes. And it, it won't be the same if you truly believe because now you are wrestling with the idea of like a man loved me so much to die for me so that I wouldn't have to experience eternal death and damnation and hell um, so that I could live forever free in paradise. When you believe that, you have no, no other choice but going forward th the process of change. And that process of change can come different for all of us. For me, it was a long, drawn, drawn out battle. For other people, their testimony might be like, I got saved, you know what I mean? And the next day, I, I, I changed everything, right? And I've been serving the Lord ever since. I hear that testimony too, and that's awesome. And then I also hear the testimonies that are like mine, these long, drawn out battles that it took a lot longer, but the process was still in place, you know? So don't compare yourself to others in that. Remember, this is a very personal relationship with God, this, this thing called faith. This is between you and God. At the end of the day, you know, when you're alone in your room and when you pray to God and when you read the Bible on your own for your edification, for you to learn more, that truly is that process of you and God. When you and God are alone, that's an opportunity to look to look yourself in the mirror, so to speak. No one's there but you and God. You know what I mean? Um, so I highly encourage any believer who's listening now or anyone who hears this on the YouTube video to ponder that and think about that for you and where you're at in your relationship with Jesus because I'm telling you guys, that's all that's going to matter. Um, I went to... Uh, a big Sunday service for Easter with my friend. Shout out to Leaf Wet. Some of you guys know him. And the pastor said something that stuck with me, you know, and he said, a thousand years from now, a hundred years from now, now, 10,000 years from now, the details of your life aren't going to really matter. You know, whether you got the promotion at work or not, whether you made a million bucks or not, whether you struggled and had a hard life or not, whether you had a charmed, blessed life, which was awesome and a great life and had money or whatever it is to have a charmed life, let's face it, in a thousand years, that won't matter. You know what I mean? In 10,000 years, that will not have mattered, but it will matter how you responded to Jesus Christ, how you responded to God, how you responded to the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it's to me, it's not even deep. It's, it's the way the truth and the life. And the more I study and the more I try to learn about the Bible and the more I do research on the side, um, the more I have discussions with the guys in my Bible study about faith, Jesus, God, the Bible, the more the dots are all connected, man. It's, it's the truth. It's a very simple, it's a very simple story. The Bible Men are broken, fallen sinners, and God sent Jesus to save us from that sin. That's it. That's it. Oh, one last thing I wanted to point out, too. Um, when the feast master says, um, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. So I think this is like humorous in a way too, because this reminds me of like even modern day parties that I've been at, right? Like, um, everybody comes in with their fresh bottle of liquor or their fresh six pack. Right. And it's the best of the best, right? Everyone's brought their beverage and it's the best stuff. But then if you're drinking and partying as the night goes on and you run out of the stuff, people start getting desperate. Right. And at that point, any old kind of liquor will do. You know what I mean? Like, get that crappy wine that we haven't touched. Or, 
run to the store and get you know one more cheap uh six pack or to keep the party going um and this is like we see this echoed here in this the guy saying well usually like they serve the best wine first and as the as the night goes on then they start serving the crappy wine which again it all works perfectly right if you're already drunk you don't really care too much about the fancy wine you just want to keep drinking so i just find that kind of humorous and how humans don't really change but I was thinking about this portion of the scripture, and I was thinking about how from the very first men till Jesus, there was no Jesus, right? There was prophecies in the Old Testament of a Jesus that would be coming, but there was no Jesus. And this connects back to Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit representing wine. God saved the best for last for humanity. I believe God was good and faithful to humanity in the Old Testament because if he is Jesus and God, there is no differentiation. God's God is good. And um, his son was like the wine. He saved the best gift for the latter part of humanity, you know, and that's that's cool, too. So uh, I'm I'm stoked because I wasn't thinking on all this stuff until I read and researched, you know, and it, it just makes my faith stronger, a little bit stronger through a little more studying and a little more learning that this whole thing about wine symbolizes like so much, you know, and then on the surface level, it's a miracle and proof of God's deity that he's God. I mean, who else can turn water into wine? That's a miracle right that that goes beyond the natural scientific limits that we face as as humans you know who who else could turn water into wine but god lord thank you for this night again thank you for this live stream on twitch god thank you um for my ability to be able to do this lord i i i thank you for that and i thank you for anyone who heard anything who will hear something in the YouTube video. Um, again, Lord, I always pray this, but I pray that people's eyes would be opened, hearts would be opened, their ears would be opened, Lord, and they would hear the truth, and it would cut through the darkness that may be going on around them or in their life or in their confusion, God, that the word of God would cut to their heart and soul and pierce them, and that you would re reveal yourself to people, Lord. That's it, Lord. Um, that's my simple request and prayer. I pray also just that you just comfort people, encourage people, guide people, reveal yourself to people, um, and bring the lost sheep um, back to the fold, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.